Well, a very good evening to you all. Thank you very much for joining us for lecture number four in the Towers of Faith series. And uh, one of the great things about being a convener of this series is it means that you can approach people to ask them to speak about things that you're interested in learning about yourself uh, in the hope that some other people will be as well. So tonight we have challenging child, avid thinker, monastic leader, bishop, father of Western theology, a person of prayer. It is St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, a fascinating and enigmatic character. And in this seminar, we will explore his understanding and the experience of prayer through a variety of his writings, including his confessions, sermons, letters, and commentaries, as well as his monastic rule. Augustine has much to teach us about prayer and theology, a prayer in the life of the church, and above all, prayer as Christ's activity in which we are invited to join. And our speaker this evening, we're delighted to welcome uh, Kirsty Borthwick, who's an ordinand at Westcott House, uh, finishing a PhD, on the doctrine of prayer in, con in conversation with St. Augustine's Trinitarian theology. Uh, she's examining what it means to pray to the Father in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ. So God and Bishop willing, she hopes to return to the Diocese of St. Albans for curacy and also to continue to explore what it means to be a theological educator. So we are hopefully getting a, a hint and a taste of things to come. Thank you very much, Kirsty, for joining us this evening and uh, over to you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so Augustine of Hippo, an invitation to prayer. Um, and I, as we'll go through, you'll see that I mean that in two senses, as the sense in which Augustine is about inviting us to pray. Um, and I hope that um, as well as learning something this evening, we can be inspired in our own prayer lives. Um, and at the end, I'm going to talk about um, some of the stuff that's coming into my uh, broader research about Christ praying and what it means to be invited by Christ to pray with him. Um, so that's kind of the two senses in which we are invited to pray. Um, here's just a brief overview of uh, how I am planning to uh, proceed this evening. Um, so I'm going to look at various aspects of uh, Augustine as a praying person. Um, so looking at him as a theological reflector, um, and we'll look at the confessions for that. Many people have possibly read that before. Um, it's a brilliant book, and actually, if you're looking for a way into Augustine's thinking, the Confessions is a great way in, um, because it's it's not quite an autobiography, but it's not far off, so it's a good way of learning something of his character. Um, we'll then look at him as a prayerful philosopher, and we'll look at his soliloquies, which were um, dialogues that he wrote very early on in his writing career, um, well before he was a priest or a bishop. Um, we'll then look at him as a prayerful theologian, um, and in that section, I'll look at On the Trinity, which is um, the work that I'm looking at in my PhD. So I'll try not to get too carried away. Um, do beckon me on if I'm taking too long in that section. But um, that's a really good insight into uh, what it is to do theology with a prayerful heart. Um, and the fact that theology and prayer are actually exactly the same thing um, and how that how that's the case. We'll look at there. Um, I'm going to look briefly at Augustine as a prayerful preacher. Um, I have to confess, this is what this is where my knowledge is weakest. I haven't had much of a chance to read through his sermons. Uh, that's next on my list once the PhD is finished. Um, so we'll look briefly in that at his homilies on the first letter, first letter of John and on the sermons of the New Testament. Um, but that may be an area for further questions if people want to explore that further. Um, then we'll look at him as a spiritual director. Um, we'll look specifically at letter 130, which is the letter he wrote to a woman named Proba. Um, and he just offers advice on prayer, uh, which will be really interesting to have a look at. Uh, we'll then look at him as a monastic leader, looking at his rule. Um, he set up a monastic community in North Africa, so we'll, uh, he wrote this to kind of guide the way that they lived as a community. Um, and the rules had a lot of influence on rules subsequently, so things like the rule of Benedict, which everyone may well know well, um, was heavily influenced by this one that Augustine wrote first. And then finally, we'll look at him as a praying disciple, uh, who Augustine was as a person of prayer before Christ is Lord. Um, and that's where we'll talk particularly about Christ inviting us to pray. Um, and hopefully plenty of time for question and answer at the end. Um, I really recommend, I love this icon of Augustine. Um, it sits on my desktop on my laptop, has done for a couple of years. Um, I just think it's brilliant and it really grabs your attention. And it's a really good reminder that whilst Augustine is the father of Western theology, he may not almost certainly wasn't your standard white western male European. Um, he lived and breathed in North Africa. Um, he was from Berber descent and I think it's really helpful for us to remember that um, that he was of a different ethnic heritage than what he's often portrayed as um, simply because 
that gets so forgotten and actually black fuel you needs to become more mainstream so um so yeah i love that icon um and do check out gracie Morbitz's work if you're an icon fan because some of hers are absolutely brilliant um so augustine as a character he was born in Fagast, which is now in northern algeria um in 354 um he his father was of roman descent his mother of berber descent um we never find out his father's name but his mother was monica um famous in her own right um and sainted as well um he studied at madaras and carthage uh, particularly in rhetoric um, that was commonplace for uh, aspiring scholars of the kind of late roman empire um and uh, he then went on to teach rhetoric um, interestingly, for any of you who have done theology degrees, have been ordinands, or are thinking of doing theology, degree, theology degrees, Augustine was awful at Greek. He hated Greek. It's an excellent little bit in the Confessions where he admits to really not liking it. Um, so if you've tried learning Greek and have failed or have really struggled, you're not alone. Um, one of the greatest fathers of the church also struggled. Um, having taught in uh, North Africa, uh, first in his hometown and then in Carthage, he moved to Rome, um, probably as a way of elevating his uh, kind of teaching and rhetoric career. Um, and then he moved to Milan, and it's in Milan that he met Ambrose, um, who was Bishop of Milan at the time, and was absolutely key in his conversion to Christianity. Um, he was converted in 386. Uh, he went away on retreat with a group of friends for a while, and we get quite a lot of writings from that time. Um, and then he was baptised by Ambrose in Milan in 387. Um, he returned to North Africa to Hippo Regis and was ordained a presbyter or a priest in 391. Um, and in the story of his consecration to become bishop is an interesting one. Um, we find information about it in an account of Augustine's life written by his friend Pasidius, and Augustine talks about it himself in one of his own sermons. Um, and Augustine insists that he didn't want to be a bishop. Um, he claims that the, the people essentially kidnapped him. Um, dragged him to the local bishop to be to be consecrated um, and forced him into it um, which I think if anything the story he tells of that conveys a lot about his character um, but it's interesting that he felt like that was something that was almost forced upon him rather than something that he uh, he kind of did of his own free will. Um, Augustine then died in August 430 in Hippo, Hippo Regis um, interestingly, this is the point where the Goths, who had already sacked Rome, uh, were sacking the north of Africa. Um, so North Africa was under invasion at this point. Um, and there's a brilliant story from uh, Pisidius about Augustine's death, um, where he lies on his deathbed as the, uh, the Goths begin attacking the city. Um, and as he dies, he requests that the, his four favourite Psalms of Penance, written by David, are placed on the walls and the ceiling of the room in which he's dying. Um, so he literally dies surrounded by his favourite prayers, um, which I think is lovely. It's a brilliant, brilliant way to go. Um, and actually says a lot about how important prayer was in his life and ministry. Um, this is just a quick map of the region, uh, just so you can see uh, the kind of extent of his travel. Um, he travelled between North Africa and Rome and Milan, so between Italy and North Africa. Um, the areas to the right of the map, so Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem and Alexandria, are marked out simply because they're the other main regions for uh, Christian academic thinking um, and the main seats of Christian power at this point. Um, so he is kind of on the, the western edge of that. Um, a lot of the early debates of the early church are happening on that eastern side of the map. Um, as we progress through uh, tonight's seminar, I'm hoping that these are the key themes that we'll, uh, we'll see in Augustine's understanding of prayer. Um, so my invitation to you as I kind of talk for the next hour or so is to, to kind of listen out for where these are present um, and to think about perhaps how they apply um, to us now as we seek to pray as Christians. Um, so those are the themes of desire, restlessness, patience, the place of Christ, and vision of God. Vision is a, a huge theme in Augustine's writing, um, with vision of God as being his understanding of eternal life. Eternal life is the final vision of God in eternity. Um, so all his prayer is driving towards that. 
Um, and I'm also uh, quite keen that we think about um, how all this that Augustine teaches us about prayer um, affects our own lives today. Um, so two questions to kind of keep in mind as I proceed. Um, one, given that we're in the week between Ascension and Pentecost, um, I want us to think about how Augustine would invite us to use this time of waiting um, for Pentecost itself, um, this time where we're invited by the archbishops to pray thy kingdom come. Um, I want us to think about how Augustine would invite us to use this time. Invite us to pray for the world um, in a time of uh, pandemic of brokenness um, and how God, how Augustine would invite us to uh, pray to God as a way of uh, seeking God's mercy and all those things. So first, theological reflector. Um, the Confessions uh, is not an autobiography. Um, it does appear to be one in some senses because the first nine books detail uh, kind of content of Augustine's life. Um, if you give it a read, you'll notice that certain things make it in, certain things don't. For instance, he spends a lot of time talking about the time as a child he nicked pears from next door's garden um, for no obvious reason other than to get the guilt off his shoulders about the fact that he'd done this. Um, he also spends a lot of time talking about his relationship with his mother. Um, so there's, there's emphases that are particularly picked out in his writings. Um, and that's because what he's writing is not just an autobiography, but a reflection on his life. He's seeking to use the narrative of his own life in order to guide the reader into a closer awareness of God. Um, so he's seeking God in all that he's lived through and inviting us to seek him as well. Um, so there's actually a sense throughout the questions we're invited to eavesdrop on the events of Augustine's life, um, which is a really interesting way of introducing us to who he is. This is the prayer that opens the confessions. Um, Great are you, O Lord, and surpassingly worthy of praise. Great is your goodness and your wisdom is incalculable. And humanity, which is but a part of your creation, wants to praise you. Even though humanity bears everywhere its own mortality and bears everywhere the evidence of its own sin and the evidence that you resist the proud. And even so, humanity, which is but a part of your creation, longs to praise you. You inspire us to take delight in praising you, for you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Um, there's always a danger with famous theologians, um, as with anyone famous, that we take one thing they say and make a huge thing of it. Um, I'm thinking particularly of someone like Julian of Norwich and her phrase that all shall be well. Um, with Augustine, actually, it rings true. This phrase uh, that he's so famous for, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, really is an operative kind of principle for everything he writes. Um, his sense that uh, he is restless and yearning for something bigger than himself and bigger than creation is key to everything that he does. Um, so a restlessness for God permeates throughout. Um, so the retractions, is a document Augustine writes towards the end of his life uh, where he basically says everything he would have corrected if he had time to go back and correct everything um, and this is what he has to say about the confessions the 13 books of my confessions both the good and the bad praise the just and good God and excite the human intellect and affection and interestingly I think actually who he's talking about there is not just himself but us um, we're encouraged to read the book and to engage with it um, whilst reflecting on our own lives um, and we're encouraged to see uh, glimmers of God in what he writes. Um, it's not just an account of him but it's an invitation to us to uh, enter into our own theological reflection. Um, Peter Brown uh, is a famous historian who writes uh, considerably on Augustine. He has probably the most famous biography of him. Um, and he says that the Confessions are one of the few books where the title is significant. Um, and I think this is really true. Um, and in particular, I think Confessions means three specific things for Augustine. Um, confession of sin. So uh, Augustine talks a lot about things that he feels he's done wrong in his past um, and uses them each time as an opportunity to pray a prayer of confession. So often he'll uh, uh, recount a narrative um, for instance, the one where he steals the pears, and then he'll pray seeking God's confession uh, at the same time. So the two kind of the two segments flow naturally into each other. Um, 
and actually you lose a sense of who he's talking to at any given time. At one point he feel, it feels like he's talking to himself, reminding himself of his memories. Then you think you're being spoken to um, and then suddenly you realise actually he's talking to God. Um, and actually what's beautiful about the text is that we all feel those conversations at the same time. Um, the second understanding of confession that he uses is confession of faith. So I believe. Um, so what Augustine is trying to do in confessions is also just teach us about the God he believes in. Um, so he uses the narrative of his life as an opportunity to say, this is God. Um, he is creator. He is uh, savior. Um, and actually with his emphasis on confessing his sins, uh, God as merciful and God as redeemer is a key theme that comes through in that. Um, finally, confession also applies to confession of praise. Um, so dotted throughout the book, there are segments where Augustine is committed purely to the praise of God. Um, and that springs from his understanding of his faith, so who God is, and from his experience uh, of the confession of his sins. Um, so actually, there's a sense in which all prayer in the book of confessions culminates in the praise of God. Um, uh, Monica's key in the confessions. Um, I could, we could probably have an entire Towers of Fame seminar on Monica alone. Um, but I've uh, chosen this image, which you can see in, well, once lockdown has ended, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see it in the uh, National Gallery in London. Um, and it's an image of the two of them sharing a mystical ascent. So Monica prays for her, uh, her well, since Augustine's birth, um, for him to convert to Christianity. He gets there eventually. He, um, he um, spends a large amount of time with a group called the Manichees for a while. Um, who are uh, dualists, um, whose opinion, whose beliefs around beliefs around God, um, in some ways, are similar to those of Christianity, but there's a clear absence of Christ, um, and philosophically, um, there's complications that mean actually it's a long way from uh, the God we see in the Gospels. Um, he then has a period where he's heavily engaged with Platonic writing, particularly the Neoplatonists. Um, so he becomes a real kind of Platonist philosopher, uh, Platonic philosopher. Um, and then uh, he has a moment in a garden where he can hear children playing um, and he senses that he can hear them saying, pick up and read, pick up and read. Uh, this is his famous phrase, tolo lege, tolo lege. Um, and he picks up the Bible that's on the bench near him um, and he reads from uh, the book of Romans. Uh, less to the Romans chapter 13 um, which reads let us live honorably as in the as in the day not in reveling and drunkenness debauchery and licentiousness quarreling and jealousy instead put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh um, and it's this point that's kind of taken to be his uh, conversion to Christ proper um, it's this point where he uh, he's traditionally thought to have become um, Christian in the full sense of that word. Um, and this ascent with Monica, this mystical ascent, follows not long after that. And interestingly, it happens just before Monica dies. Um, so we, uh, the Confessions includes a conversation Augustine has with Monica, where Monica essentially says, I've prayed for you all my life, um, for you to become a Christian, you have, and I can die in peace. Um, so it's a beautiful moment between the two of them. Um, and rather than Kind of talking endlessly about it i'm just going to read you what it says um and then leave the confessions there and we'll move on to the soliloquies um so this is what augustine says of the ascent our conversation concluded that the enjoyment of the physical senses however great and however effective in giving earthly enlightenment is not worthy to be preferred not even considered in comparison with the joy of eternal life we raised ourselves up and with hearts aflame for the one we made our gradual ascent through the physical world and even heaven itself, where sun and moon and stars shine upon the earth. And now we were climbing still further by pondering, discussing and marvelling at your works. We entered into our own minds and transcended them to reach that place of unfailing abundance where you feed Israel forever with the food of truth. There life is the wisdom by which all other things come to be both past and future. Wisdom which is not created, but rather exists just as it always has been and always will be. 
In fact, it does not have the capacity either to have existed or to come to exist. It simply is because it is eternal. Um, one thing to note is that this, uh, this ascent is momentary, it's transitory, um, and that will be key when we come on to uh, Augustine's writings on the Trinity, um, where he talks about eternity as being something that's, uh, that's eternal, and where this vision of God is an eternal one, rather than temporary. Um, so while we spoke, we also gazed upon wisdom with longing. We reached out and touched it as best we could with every beat of our heart. Then we sighed and left behind us where they belonged, those first fruits of the spirit. We returned to the clamour of our usual kind of speech, in which words have both beginnings and endings. Yet what can compare with your word, our Lord, who is everlasting, never ageing, yet making all things new? So, uh, Augustine, the prayerful philosopher. Um, Augustine remains a philosopher all through his life, um, but given that he had such a heavy interest in the Platonic writing um, earlier in life, the early time around his conversion is particularly fruitful for philosophical writing. Um, I'm not a philosopher, so I often don't really understand the depth of what he's going on about. Um, I'm sure philosophers would be able to offer many more insights. Um, but I really like the soliloquies for the odd comments it makes on prayer, but also for the way in which it's written. Um, so it's a dialogue, um, similar to the dialogue we see in Plato's writings. Um, and the dialogue is between Augustine and his reason. Um, so it's written out almost like the script of a play. You have Augustine speak, then reason speak, Augustine and reason. Um, and this is the conversation that the text begins with. Um, uh, reason asks Augustine um, to pray to God for understanding and insight uh, before they begin their conversation. And um, Augustine says, behold, I have prayed to God. Uh, reason then asks, what would you know? Um, and Augustine said all these things which I prayed for. And reason asks him to sum them up. And Augustine says, God and the soul, that is what I desire to know. Nothing more nothing whatever um so everything that follows from this point in this very philosophical writing um is in fact all about trying to find a deeper understanding of god and of the soul himself um and here we have that desire coming through already very early in his early writings um i'm gonna skip through this bit because i am running tight on time but uh here in so there's two books to the soliloquies um the beginning of the second one uh begins like this uh reason says therefore pray most briefly and perfectly as much as you can um so reason asks augustine to pray in the simplest way possible augustine res augustine's response is god always the same let me know myself let me know you and that's it um so actually as an insight into kind of the simplest desires of the human heart and how we might best them in prayer um, this is what Augustine chooses to pray for um, that he might know God and that he might know himself um, and we see that prevalent throughout all his writings um, it's right at the heart of the restlessness which he talks about um, I'm also just going to read through this bit because it uh, brings us back to the theme of the vision of God um, so in conversation with uh, Augustine, uh, reason says that for the senses of the soul are as it were the eyes of the mind, but all the certainties of the sciences are like those things which are brought to light by the sun, that they may be seen, the earth for instance, and the things upon it, while God him is himself the illuminator. Now I reason am in that, that in the mind, which the act of looking is in the eyes. So we have, parallels drawn between the eyes of the body which help us see things in the world reason is the eyes of the mind that help us to see things in our understanding but the key is that it's god that illuminates all of that um, and this will be really key in a moment when we come on to augustine as a prayerful theologian um, because this is exactly what um, augustine is trying to explore in his doctrine of the trinity um, vision of god is what he is ultimately aiming for uh, so prayerful theologian um, 
there are various places where there are prayers in this text. Um, the text itself is quite long. Um, the book I have, which I'm using, is literally the size of a brick, so it's quite a long text um, and quite difficult to read in places. It is quite dense and uh, the logic can be a bit complicated. Um, but at the same time, there are moments of complete clarity. Um, he's excellent at writing like that. He'll go off on a tangent, get lost, um, confuse his reader no end, and then when he comes back to simplicity, it's in prayer, um, which I think is a really interesting insight on kind of the role of prayer in his writing. Um, this is something that he says uh, early on in On the Trinity about Christ praying specifically. Um, so he says that when therefore Christ has handed over the kingdom to God and the Father, um, that is when he has brought those who believe and live by faith, for whom he now makes intercession as mediator, to that contemplation which we are sighing and yearning to attain, and when weariness and weeping are at an end, he will then no longer intercede for us to God and the Father, once he has handed over the kingdom. Um, by handing over the kingdom, Augustine ultimately means uh, the Perusia, the second coming, the kind of final handing over of creation uh, to God the Father. Um, but he also means everything that leads to that point. So he means the incarnation, the birth of Christ. He means uh, Christ's passion, his death on the cross, his resurrection and his ascension. Um, he talks about the descent of the sun being all of that, that whole narrative of Christ's life in his uh, coming to earth and uh, the sun's coming to earth and returning to uh, the father. Um, and all of that in a sense is an act of intercession. Um, Augustine describes it all as an activity that's for us, uh, his creation. Um, but it's also uh, pivotal that the cross is the key point of that mediation. Um, the incarnation is key because it's what makes the cross possible, but the cross is key as that point where the mediation uh, takes full effect. Um, so Augustine is certainly very cross-centred in his, and uh, Christocentric in his uh, theology. Um, but it's interesting that that intercession has, a, has an aim, uh, the intercession of Christ has an end point, and that is the contemplation which we are sighing and yearning to attain. So again, we have the vision of God as the final aim of our prayer. Um, prayer is not just about offering up things that we need or about um, asking God to intervene in the life of the world. It's all those things, but it's also those things with the end aim of creation coming to behold its creator. Um, at the end of all things. So it's, our, its end aim is one of acquaintance and relationship and presence. Um, and the intercession is a part of that journey. Um, it's interesting that he says that Christ will cease to intercede for us. Um, I'm, my PhD is looking at, in part, whether or not God is in, how God is involved in prayer um, and whether or not we can say that God prays, which is a complicated question that comes with many caveats. Um, but here, Augustine makes a very certain point in regards to that, which is that Christ will cease to intercede for us. But that specifically is when we come to full vision of God. Um, and the reason why he's ceasing at that point will become more apparent when we see uh, the place of Christ in our prayer in um, Augustine's writing on the Psalms at the end of the seminar. Um, at the same time, saying that uh, Christ's intercession for us will cease, at the very end of On the Trinity, so book 15, he makes a point that eternity is not static, um, it's restful, but it's not, uh, it's not, it, sta static is probably the best word, it's not static, it's dynamic, um, and in particular he talks about eternity as a process of seeking and finding. Um, he draws on Psalm 105 for this, um, and also on some of the, uh, the words of the Book of Wisdom. Um, and he talks about eating and drinking, hungering and thirsting, um, in order to talk about, in a very tangible way, um, the yearning within him for God that won't stop in eternity, but will be continually met and inspired further, um, which I think is a really beautiful picture of eternity that's not just we, we're in the presence of God, the end, it's in, we're in the presence of God and there's still more to explore. Um, I think is a, yeah, just a really exciting prospect. Um, on the Trinity is probably most famous for the images of the Trinity that Augustine gives us. Um, 
specifically images of the Trinity in the mind. Um, a lot of scholars talk about these as analogies. So they say that um, Augustine presents a picture of the mind and says, well, this bit is analogous to the Father and this bit analogous to the Son and this bit analogous to the Holy Spirit. That's not what Augustine is doing. Um, and I think we miss some of the riches of his spirituality if we get too attached to that kind of analogy uh, idea. Rather, what he's doing is inviting us to find the image of God in us as we draw closer to God. So to be in the image of God is not just to be like God in this respect or that respect, not like God because we're creative or like God because we're rational, but to be in the image of God is to be like God because we are moving ever towards a closer relationship with God. Um, it's not just to be an image, but to be imaging. Um, and he talks about the imaging of God in the mind, not just as the mind remembering, understanding and loving itself. So there's those three parts that get confused as the kind of three analogies for the three persons. Um, it's not just the mind remembering, understanding and loving itself, but specifically the mind remembering, understanding and loving the, the God by whom it was made. Um, so the full imaging of the Trinity, the full imaging of God within us is finally found in worship. Um, which is, I guess, another way of saying that um, the kind of biblical idea that we are created for the praise of God. Um, Augustine takes that seriously and also takes that seriously intellectually, which I think is uh, really helpful, and actually really good for um, the church to remember that theology is not just something that we do in ivory towers, um, but something that's at the heartbeat of the life of the church um, and at the life of prayer. Um, this, again, is a prayer that Augustine offers in On the Trinity. I'm going to just read it again for you. Um, I think in many ways it speaks for itself. There's a bit that, that I've taken some chunks out just to shorten it. Um, there's a bit I'll read in a moment, which if any of you are uh, writers or academics, or in fact, if any of you uh, suffer from anxiety like I do, will resonate. And you'll know it when you find it. But there's a point where Augustine's kind of nervous character comes through. Um, which is a really nice moment of kind of seeing the real Augustine in his writing. Um, but yeah, I hope these prayers kind of speak for themselves. So directing my attention towards this rule of faith as best I could, as far as you enabled me to, I have sought you and desired to see intellectually what I have believed, and I have argued much and toiled much. O oh Lord my God, my one hope, listen to me, lest, our, lest of weariness I should stop wanting to seek you, but let me seek your face always and with ardour. Do you yourself give me the strength to seek, having caused yourself to be found, and having given me the hope of finding you more and more? Before you lies my strength and my weakness. Preserve the one, heal the other. Before you lies my knowledge and my ignorance. Where you have opened to me, receive me as I come in. Where you have shut to me, open to me as I knock. Let me remember you. Let me understand you. Let me love you. Increase these things in me until you refashion me entirely. Deliver me, my God, from the much speaking which I suffer from inwardly in my soul, which is so wretched in your sight and flies to your mercy for refuge. My thoughts are not silent, even when my voice is. So when we do attain to you, there will be an end to these many things which we say and do not attain. And you will remain one, yet all in all, and we shall say one thing, praising you in unison, even ourselves being also made one in you. O Lord, the one God, God the Trinity, whatsoever I have said in these books is of you, may those that are yours acknowledge. Whatsoever of myself alone, do you and yours forgive. Amen. Um, so moving on now to Augustine as a preacher, um, as I said at the beginning, this is probably the area where I know the least, um, so if anyone else has expertise in this area, I'd love to hear it at the end. Um, but Augustine preaches a lot, an awful lot. Um, it's one of the key parts of his ministry, um, and I think he's like, open for far more interpretation and far more reading, um, given that in his preaching, we see Augustine engaging directly with his church, and particularly the church that he is ministering to. Um, but actually, in trying to understand what it is to be a minister or what it is to uh, minister to God's people in a particular place, say a particular parish, um, I think the sermons 
may be a really interesting place to go um, to find out more about what Augustine has to say about that. Um, so there's going to be two particular uh, sets of sermons that I'll look at. The first is the homilies on 1 John. Um, Augustine preaches these during Easter week, uh, which is important to remember. Um, these are never detached from the, the liturgy and the liturgical calendar. Um, so the fact that the homilies on 1 John are preached in the week following Easter Sunday is really key. Um, the sermons in the New Testament, I'm afraid I don't know when they were preached. Um, I ran out of time in which to look that up. Um, but uh, in particular, I'm going to look at some of the stuff that he says uh, when he's preaching on the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Um, so first, the homily on, uh, his first homily on 1 John. Um, the homilies on 1 John are written specifically at the time when the Donatists um, are gaining uh, control in North Africa. Um, Donatism was a schism within the church. Um, so it was a church that kind of broke off from the mainstream uh, Catholic church at the time, um, particularly over questions of purity and the sacraments. Um, so they believed that, or they argued that the, um, the efficacy of the sacraments, so whether or not the Eucharist and baptism were effective, depended on the piety of the minister administering them. Um, thankfully, the Book of Common Prayer came along and made absolutely clear that does not apply in the Church of England. Um, but it caused massive division in the early church and created a clear split between bishops who were considered part of the church and bishops who were considered not part of the church. Um, and so in this divorce controversy, Augustine, in the week after the resurrection, decides to tackle uh, this breakaway schism, schismatic group um, and does so by preaching on love. Um, so rather than attacking their... Uh, theology of the sacraments or their understanding of uh, the orders of the church um, he goes in positively and says uh, God calls us to love God and to love our neighbour um, and to love our neighbour is not to divide the church um, and actually in doing that there are instances where he refers to the prayer as part of this um, so in this text from uh, the first homily um, there's a section where he talks about uh, prayer and asks people to pray. Uh, so, thus the apostle says to the congregation, praying with all for, all for us also. The apostle prays for the people, the people pray for the apostle. We pray for you, brethren, but do you also pray for us? Let all the members pray one for another. Let the head intercede for all. And that's, that's Christ there. Therefore, it is no marvel that he here goes on and shuts the mouths of them that divide the church of God. Um, so clearly praying for each other out of charity for each other um, is for Augustine key to the kind of unity of the church um, and to the healing of divisions. Um, this is a, a section of the eighth homily on 1 John 4, um, which is that beautiful passage about uh, God is love and if we abide in love, we abide in God. Um, and key here is that first line where he says, love is a sweet word, but sweeter the deed. Um, so for him, prayer and action aren't separated. Um, to love one's neighbour and praying for them cannot be separated from loving one's neighbour in uh, charitable action. Um, so at the end of this passage, he talks about works of mercy, affections of charity, sanctity of piety, incorruptness of chastity, modesty of sobriety. These things are always to be practised, whether we are in public or at home. Um, so living a charitable life towards the world is just as essential as praying um, and actually the two actions for him are bound closely together. Um, this is Augustine's, one of Augustine's sermons on the Lord's Prayer. There are, I believe off the top of my head, there are four sermons that he has on um, the New Testament which are specifically on the text of the Lord's Prayer. Um, it may possibly be four or five around that sort of number. Um, this is the first of those. Um, and in it, he makes clear that the Lord's Prayer is, should be the rule by which our prayer is offered. Um, so uh, if God knows what we need, why should we, use, should we use so many words? What's the point of praying at all? Augustine asks, and he answers by saying, uh, the words, therefore, which our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us in his prayer, because that's the Lord's Prayer, are the rule and standard of our desires. You may not ask for anything but for what is written there. Um, so the Lord's Prayer is provided um, as a way for us to 
uh, spiritually encounter our desires, offer those before God, um, but we're invited to do so within the framework of the Lord's Prayer. We're not bound to the Lord's Prayer. Um, if anything we pray fits within what Christ offers in those words, um, then it's considered a good and fruitful prayer. Um, but the Lord's Prayer is the kind of benchmark um, for what it is to pray. Um, I've included this little section, which is from uh, his uh, discussion of the phrase, your kingdom come, because it's my kingdom come week. I thought this would be a good one to choose. Um, and I think there's something really powerful in this about the way that he clearly cares about the coming of the kingdom in terms of love and labor and the building of justice and uh, the breaking down of uh, all that divides and um, false power. Um, but here, when it comes to Lord's Prayer, his focus is not on doing those things, uh, but on changing oneself. Um, so in the middle of this text, it says, Lo, here is the kingdom whereof we say your kingdom come. We pray that it may come in us. We pray that we may be found in it. Um, so moving on now to Augustine as a spiritual director. Um, we have tons of letters um, of Augustine's exchanged with various people, some of them very well known. Uh, Jerome, for instance, is one of those who's famous for his translation of the scriptures, um, and some of them barely known at all. Um, he writes four letters to a woman named Prima, um, and letter 130 is specifically on prayer. Um, Proba was a widow. She had fled from the city of Rome in 410 when it was attacked by the Goths. Um, so she was a widow and a refugee in North Africa. Um, she moved to Hippo Regis, so probably knew Augustine very well. Um, and she writes to him with two specific questions. The questions are, Um, how should I, uh, what manner of person should I be when I pray? So question one, what manner of person should I be when I pray? And question two, what should I pray? So she wants to know where in herself, what sort of person should she be aiming to be um, in order to approach God in prayer? And then what, what should I actually say? Um, and what should I pray for? Um, and Augustine uses her um, he points to her as a widow and says, in some respects, um, you are in a position of poverty. Um, you're, you've fled your home city um, and your husband has died. Um, in other respects, she was a noble uh, woman, so she wasn't without wealth. So in other respects, she wasn't poor at all. Um, and Augustine points at these two things and says, poverty is exactly where your prayer should be coming from. Um, and not just poverty of uh, poverty in kind of mon money terms in terms of wealth um, but also poverty in terms of spirituality and position before God um, he's trying to encourage her to be as humble as she possibly can um, to see her poverty as a creature before her creator um, so he says to her wherefore until that consolation come um, by which he means uh, coming to the presence of God in eternity. Remember, in order to your continuing in prayers and supplications night and day, that however great the temporal prosperity may be which flows around you, you are desolate. Um, there are then a set of uh, kind of juxtapositions that Augustine works with in the letter um, in order to answer her questions. The first one is the juxtaposition between the command in 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing and the command of Christ in Matthew 6 to stop heaping up empty words. Um, the question is, well, do I pray without ceasing or do I say as little as possible? Which of the two um, does God ask of me? Um, in answering this question, uh, interestingly, especially for next week's uh, seminar, um, Augustine praises the Arab prayer tradition of the Egyptian desert fathers. Um, Arab prayers are still commonplace today. Um, kind of short, sharp prayers offered to God um, in moments of need 
Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It might be now be liturgical, but actually in some senses, it's an arrow prayer. Um, Augustine offers those to her as a way of uh, engaging with God um, and offering just, and asking for just what she needs, but without the heaping up of empty words. Um, he also says this, um, I'm going to pick out a phrase from the very centre of this text. So, for to spend a long time in prayer is not as something the same thing as to pray with much speaking. Multiplied words are one thing, long continued warmth of desire is another. Um, so actually what he's trying to get at is, to a certain extent, the words don't really matter. What, what, what's happening in your heart? Um, what is the, the depth of the desire that you're bringing before God? Um, what is the depth of the desire for God that you're bringing before God? Um, that is the prayer about ceasing. And that's what God's calling to do. Um, and then interestingly, he points us right back to Christ. Christ is our example in this. Um, for even of the Lord himself, it is written that he continued all night in prayer and his prayer was more prolonged when he was in an agony. And in this is not an example given to us by him who is in time an intercessor such as we need and who is with the Father eternally, the hearer of prayer. Um, get a beautiful insight there into kind of the complexity of what's going on in God when we pray, that Christ intercedes and uh, Christ is with the Father as he hears. Um, but also we're led to an encounter with uh, Christ incarnate on the cross and in the garden um, and on the mountain top um, and hours and hours of silent and sometimes deeply struggling um, in yearning and desire for God. And that is to be Prober's example. Um, Augustine also says that uninterrupted desire is kind of praying without ceasing. Um, is to also to be found in the way that we live um, and specifically in the exercise of faith, hope and charity. In exercising those Christian virtues, we pray always, even if we don't use words. Um, a, another uh, juxtaposition that Augustine works with in his answer to Prober's questions is that between example prayer, um, so you know, we have say a collect we can pray or we have the Lord's Prayer that we can pray, we have a text in front of us and the idea that comes from uh, the letter to the Romans that we don't know what we ought to be praying for. Um, kind of how do we exist between that tension of having prayers there ready for us to use but actually the deep spiritual sense in that which we don't really know what to pray for at all. Um, Again, he returns to the idea that the Lord's Prayer is the, uh, the best guide. Um, so if we genuinely don't know what to pray for, don't know what we ought to pray, uh, the Lord's Prayer contains everything that our prayer should be. Um, so he again and again offers the Lord's Prayer to people as uh, the prime example of what it is to pray. Um, but he also talks about this thing called a learned ignorance, um, which is an ignorance that which we learn from the spirit of God who helps our infirmities. So actually by being led deeper into prayer, so as the spirit moves in us and leads us to intercede, so as the spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words, as Romans 8 says, um, we're actually in a way led into deeper ignorance. Not knowing what to pray becomes more a thing um, as we enter deeper into the desire for God that is prayer without worrying about what specifically to pray for. Um, and actually, I'm, I see something like this, and it makes me think of, you know, we see so many reports uh, on news at the moment from hospitals um, and from gravesides, and uh, I'm sure we, we've all come across people who have uh, lost loved ones in recent months. Um, and that groan of despair in those moments, I think that's what he means by learned ignorance. That's, that's prayer. Um, that kind of groaning and that's why he uses the spirit groaning with size too deep for words as an example for God moving in us to pray um, so to a extent, certain extent words don't matter um, again it's about desire and yearning and restlessness um, 
Um, okay, let's move on to uh, Augustine as a monastic leader. Um, so Augustine set up a monastery in North Africa when he moved back from Rome. Um, and when he did so, he wrote a rule. Um, the rule's very short. There's only 12 very short sections. So if any of you know Benedict's rule, for instance, that's a lot longer. Um, and the sections that Augustine covers are love of God, common property, prayer, meals, dress, modesty, fraternal connection to kind of brotherly com community, uh, clothing and gifts, common supplies, and often that's about kind of the clothes that they share or the food they share, uh, reconciliation, uh, the, the role of the superior, and then a final exhortation. Um, he bases his understanding of the community that he's trying to form on the Jerusalem community that we see in Acts 4. Um, so you can see that here in his understanding of what it is to love God, which interestingly is to love neighbour. The two are um, completely tied together. Um, for him to love God is to love his uh, siblings in Christ. Um, first, that you dwell together in unity in the house and be of one mind and one heart in God, remembering that this is the end for which you are collected here. Call not anything your own, but let all things be held in common among you. We have here almost an exact replica of uh, the earliest community in Jerusalem. And um, this is what he says in the section regarding prayer itself. Um, he insists that uh, those in the community are constant in prayer at appointed hours and times. He's very keen about using the oratory for its intended purpose, so kind of separating it as a, um, a space set aside for prayer. Um, Augustine is famous for having said, probably didn't actually say, but this is a paraphrase, that the person who uh, sings prays twice. Um, singing was a, a large part of his uh, understanding of prayer and worship. Um, and uh, so he addresses the question of singing and chanting here as well. And again, it's key that we believe in our hearts what we say with our mouths. Um, this is what Augustine says at the very end of the rule. So this is his final exhortation. And I just point this out because I think it's really interesting that where he ends is with forgiveness and a prayer to not be led into temptation. Again, he's taking words directly from the Lord's Prayer, which is his kind of prime example of what it is to pray. Um, and there's a kind of realism in him, which I think is really helpful, that the brothers are going to fall out, the sisters are going to fall out, um, but that forgiveness should be at the heart of the community. And I think actually this harks back to the sort of thing we saw him saying in response to the Donatist controversy in his homilies on 1 John. Um, he's, he's the guy who... Uh, came up with the idea of original sin to explain our brokenness. He's he's not blind to the kind of the frailty of the created world, um, but forgiveness is clearly for him the way in which we build something that's more godlike, more Christ-like. Um, and then to finish, we're just running out of time slightly. Um, I'm going to look at Augustine as a praying disciple, to who Augustine was as a person of prayer, and actually what this can what this teaches about what happened when we pray um, and I think it's here that we're really invited to uh, to engage God in prayer in a um, tangible and fresh sense. Um, so here I'm looking at his expositions on the Psalms. Um, I am the biggest evangelist for this piece of writing. I just, I just love them. Um, so I cannot recommend them highly enough. Pick your favourite Psalm, see what he says on it. This His writing in this text is just incredible. Um, and incredibly spiritually rich. It's worth worth some time. Um, one that he spends a lot of time on is Psalm 22. Um, this psalm causes theologians a load of bother. Um, it can be difficult to preach on. Um, it's the words that Christ uses on the cross. He uses the words of Psalm 22 um, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, which causes theologians to scratch their heads because well, if Christ is God incarnate, how can he be forsaken by God? What's going on here? Um, and Augustine asked that same question um, and it leads him into a reflection of prayer and it leads him to ask, well, who's praying? Who's speaking here? Um, and this is where we get his famous idea of the totus Christus or the whole Christ. Um, so there are three possible voices whenever we uh, hear a psalm. One person praying is the church, um, the prayer of uh, the church community. One person praying is 
you, yourself. You are saying the words of the Psalms, you are praying that Psalm. And the third person praying is Christ. Um, so the Psalms are the prayers of Christ. And that's why they're the prayers of the church, because Christ is the head of the body and the church is the body of Christ. Um, and that's why he uses this phrase totus Christus or whole Christ, because when we pray, we are bound up, even when we pray alone, in the prayers of the whole church, the whole Christian community, and in the prayers of Christ himself. Um, and if that's not an invitation to pray, I don't know what is. You get to join in with what Christ is doing. Um, and actually learning this and dwelling and thinking about this the last three years has made praying the Psalms, especially at morning evening prayer, take on a whole new meaning. Um, there's something really powerful about knowing that when you're speaking those words, you're speaking them alongside the entire Christian community, um, geographically and temporally, so across time, um, and with Christ, God incarnate. Yeah, um, it's an incredible idea of what prayer is. Um, he also has some really interesting things to say about Psalm 133. So this is the Psalm in full, it's one of the shorter ones. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred led together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. And here we have uh, the whole Christ, the totus Christus, exemplified in a really really helpful way um so augustine says what was aaron he was a priest and who is our priest well our one priest is christ who enters the holy of holies uh, ascension um, and bears human body and blood into the presence of god um, so the head is christ but from christ pulls down through the beard and onto the collars of clothing um, that prayer which pours down through Christ, through the apostles, onto the community of the church. And this is what it is to dwell together in unity. And interestingly, in particular, he points to this in the context of suffering and persecution. So at the end, he says, For they who first began to dwell together in unity suffered persecution, but because the ointment descended to the beard, they suffered but were not conquered. Um, so to be united in prayer in Christ as the church um, Augustine is clear that part of our focus has to be the persecuted, um, which is a wonderful reminder to pray for those who, uh, for whom prayer is a dangerous thing. Um, and of course, this all reminds us and takes us back to uh, the most famous of persecutions of the Christian faith, which is the crucifixion of Christ. Um, and so Augustine points to Hermon, which in the psalm um, is the the place where the dew come from, comes from, which falls on the mountains of Zion. He says, Hermon is said to me in a light set on a high place, for from Christ comes the dew. No light is set on a high place save Christ. And how is he set on high? First on the cross, afterwards in heaven. Set on high on the cross when he was humbled. Humbled, but his humiliation could not but be high. Um, and so actually what Augustine is saying is that the cross itself is an act of prayer. It is the act of prayer. Um, it's the act of mediation of Christ on behalf of the people of God before God. Um, so actually, if you want to know what prayer is like, we also need to look directly at the cross. Um, and interestingly, I've uh, been thinking a lot about what this means for things like how we celebrate Good Friday. Um, those in the um, more Catholic uh, traditions of the Church of England, for instance, um, will often venerate the cross on Good Friday. And there are intercessions said before the cross during that service. Um, and what does, it, what does it mean for us to do that on Good Friday if we are commemorating that moment on the hill of Golgotha uh, 2000 years ago, where all prayer was summed up, actually to be joining in with that in the liturgy on Good Friday um, is a really powerful, powerful thing. Um, and then finally, he uh, he speaks at length on Psalm 86. This is just the very beginning of the psalm. Um, it's one walk throughout with kind of pleading towards God uh, for preservation and for answers to our needs. Um, and Augustine uses this to talk about Christ and Christ's prayer. Um, so again, this is the last bit 
um, of the of the talk. And I'm just going to read this out because um, again, I think it speaks for itself better than I could explain it. Um, and essentially, it's Augustine explaining to us how it is that we join with Christ in prayer, um, and specifically with Christ in His humanity uh, before the Father. Uh, so this is what Augustine says. No greater gift could God have given to men than in making his word, uh, so that's Christ, by which he created all things, their head, and joining them to him as his members, that the Son of God might become also the Son of Man, one God with the Father, one man with men, so that when we speak to God in prayer for mercy, we do not separate the Son from him. And when the body of the Son prays, it separates not its head from itself. And it is one saviour of his body, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who both prays for us and prays in us and is prayed to by us. He prays for us as our priest. He prays in us as our head. He is praised to by us as our God. Let us therefore recognise in him our words and his words in us. Nor when anything is said of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially in prophecy, implying a degree of humility below the dignity of God, let us hesitate to ascribe it to him who did not hesitate to join himself unto us. He is prayed to in the form of God, in the form of a servant he prays, there the creator, here created, assuming unchanged the creature that it might be changed, and making us with himself one man, head and body. Therefore we pray to him, through him, in him and we speak with him and he speaks with us we speak in him he speaks in us the prayer of this psalm which is entitled the prayer of david for our lord was according to the flesh the son of david but according to his divine nature the lord of david and his maker let no one then when he hears these words say christ speaks not nor again i say i speak not Nay, rather, if he own himself to be in the body of Christ, let him say both, Christ speaks and I speak. Be thou unwilling to say anything without him, and he says nothing without you. Thank you very much. Gizzy, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, you've opened up Augustine for me and I'm sure for many others in a new way. I remember my time in Kedston in the Graham Room on a hot spring day where we flew through Augustine, dates, events, <laughs> life, history, very little on his faith. And um, your talk this evening uh, has brought his faith forward in a way that has allowed me to understand him and, and perhaps God a little better. And to hear about his mother and her prayers for her son in this time, particularly when we're being called to pray for five people to come to faith in the Thy Kingdom Come call, I wonder whether or not perhaps we should follow her example and pray for just one person and then perhaps have to pray all of our lives for them to come to Jesus. And maybe that's, that's enough. Um, you told us that Augustine is most himself when he comes back, from, uh, comes back to simplicity after a distraction. Uh, to simplicity in prayer and perhaps that simplicity in prayer is the best place to help us during these strange times. The most powerful thing for me in your talk tonight was to be reminded of his perhaps best known uh, exhortation, prayer instruction and that is our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And the spirit of these talks has been about helping us find a closer and more powerful relationship with God through the example of those who've gone before us. And I'm left with one overarching question at the end of this talk. And you posed it, Kirsty, right at the start of your talk, but I wonder if it's worth bringing around again now. And it is, how would St. Augustine invite us to pray into the world right now? So. Um, yeah. Um... <laughs> have grown for it above all else um, to, to kind of observe his he's so attached to vision uh, to seeing the world to seeing oneself um, with the end to seeing God so to actually to just sit and watch what's going on in the world and 
to offer that up in prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, in uh, whatever prayer comes to mind, but also just to groan for it, to groan for creation. Um, and actually, in terms of kind of day-to-day -day ministry, weep with those who weep, cry with those who cry, laugh with those who laugh. Um, I think uh, one thing that's really interesting about Augustine, his, his, um, his full grasp, grasp of what it is to be human, um, and I think he never, reg regardless of how kind of misconstrued he becomes with uh, all his stuff to do with sin and sex and the body, actually he's really, he's really concerned with what it is to be human before God. And so kind of just resting in and being aware of and uh, voicing before God our humanity um, is I think what Augustine would advise us to do. Um, and actually, I think to to realise that some of that starts with us as well as with the world. Um, so, for instance, that um, passage we had on thy kingdom come, um, yeah. that prayer, that actually part of that is the groan for God's creation. Part of that's the groan for ourselves as well and to allow ourselves to be changed by God's grace. Um, and that us being changed and going out to do works of charity is as much an answer to that groan as... Uh, as the grace of God is. Christy, thank you. Thank you very much for answering that. Everybody, whilst you are starting to uh, coalesce and think about your questions for Kirsty, uh, let me just throw ahead to next week. Uh, we'll be welcoming Jarrell Robinson Brown, who's going to be talking about, and forgive me for the pronunciation if I'm not saying this right, and you know how to say it, but uh, Chanute the Great. Uh, Jarrell tells us that in recent times, the writings of Chanute the Great have been appreciated for the unique contribution to the ancient writings of early Egyptian monasticism. And in the session that Jarrell is going to lead, he will, will consider Chanute's writing around discipline and desire in fourth century Egypt. Uh, so I'm gonna hand over to Father Chris now with one final thank you and goodbye from me for Kirsty. Thank you very much. Father Chris is going to uh, sort out the questions. Father. Thank you, Father Matthew. Um, yes, so um, the floor is open to you all to ask any questions you might have of Kirsty. Um, I hope you've had a chance to think. Um, there's a great deal of material that we've been um, very lucky to hear this evening. Can I invite you, please, if you'd like to ask Kirsty a question, to raise your hand either um, using the, uh, the, the hand raising button or the reaction button or um, simply gesticulating wildly at the screen and I will get you. Um, I'm going to come first to Father Jarrell. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, for that. It was amazing. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about some of the things Father Matthew was saying about, um, you know, prayer for people and often thinking about um, the role of the family in terms of nurturing um, new Christians. And I'm often in kind of influenced by Augustine's own life and the impact that his mother has on him, but also people like Origen, um, whose mother and father have an impact on him. And um, Origen's mother hid his clothes to stop him from running and running away to martyrdom. Um, and he wanted to go and die because he has seen his father die as a martyr and it's a big impact on him. Um, so I was interested in that and also um, what you think or what you feel about Augustine's child and the lady who gave birth to his child, who we don't really hear much about. Um, and if you had anything to say about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Augustine's relationship with his mother is fascinating um, and very, very varied. Um, he, he, early on in his confession, he talks about being breastfed by his mother as a kind of sign of his kind of sinful dependence. Um, and I must admit, I read that and I think, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, um, he then, uh, he kind of, I, I wonder sometimes if Monica is a very, very over the top and very kind of exuberant in the love that she shows for her son. And actually he goes through a teenage stage of going, you know, get away, from, like, let me be, let me be me. Um, and we see some of that kind of character shining through in both of them. Um, he, uh, has a long-term partner, a very long, long-term partner, um, who he doesn't marry, um, who he has a child with, a son. 
um, whose name I can't remember, but we do know his name. Um, I, I want to say it's Olypius, but that may be his friend's name. Don't hold me to that. Um, he has a young son who doesn't survive very long into adulthood. He dies very young. Um, but we get kind of moments uh, where Augustine lets us into his relationship with him um, and mentions him in his writings, uh, especially mentioning kind of conversa academic conversations with him, talking to him about God. Um, and Augustine deeply loves the mother of his child. Um, he uh, ends the relationship because his mother is trying to force him into a marriage. Um, so his kind of, his relationship with his partner and his mother is really complex. And I actually think, I wonder to a certain extent if the, uh, the ascent at Ostia, which, which I mentioned earlier, um, just before Monica dies, is actually a kind of reconciliation moment between the two of them. Um, so I, I quite like that painting for the way they kind of hold hands together um, and she looks frail and he looks like the young son sat at her side. Um, there's a kind of a culmination in that picture that says that there's a history here that has kind of uh, come to a moment of forgiveness and peace. Um, and I wonder if that's also partly why he kind of gives that story and then goes straight to her death. Um, his, his relationship with her kind of comes to some sort of uh, peace. Um, I think there's a lot more to be said about Monica and about his partner. I'd love to see some research on that. Um, and actually, just a bit of a plug uh, for a book that I haven't read yet, it's on order. Um, but Natalie Cairns has recently written a book uh, uh, called Motherhood, which rewrites confessions um, from the perspective of Monica talking to her son. Um, and I, I heard her read a chapter of that um, at SST conference a year ago, and it was incredibly moving and actually painted a whole new perspective on, um, on kind of their relationship. So I think, just to correct myself there, I think she's, Natalie talks about her relationship with her child, but kind of thinks of, puts that in the context of the relationship of Augustine and Monica. Um, so I think there's kind of, there's really fruitful stuff to be found in their relationship, and I hope people kind of make stuff of that. Sorry, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, Jared. I kind of just waffled. But. That's perfect. Really helpful. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from anyone? I don't see any hands up, actually. Um, oh, Hannah's got a question. Hannah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you, Kirsty. That was really, really rewarding um, and has helped me with understanding a bit more about Augustine and what you've been up to. Um, my question is about so not religious experience as such but sincerity and kind of emotional and perhaps even physiological engagement with prayer um how does augustine deal with prayer um so for instance the daily office one of the merits of it is that you say it however you feel it's no you don't have to be 100 percent engaged with all of it um so how does augustine see prayer in that sense um is that valid prayer if you're coming without anything and completely dry? Uh, good question. Um, partly I don't know what Augustine would say, but I can definitely say what I've kind of got from conversation, intellectual conversation with Augustine. Um, and whether that's accurate to what he'd say or not, I don't know. Um, but I hope it's formed in kind of prayerful reading of him. Um, so as regards kind of things like uh, approaching prayer when when actually you don't feel very prayerful and you're saying the words because you're called to say the words. Um, it's the idea of the totus Christus that we get from his exposition on the Psalms, which I think is really helpful there. Um, the kind of sense that actually when we're praying, the church is praying and Christ is praying. So if I don't feel like I'm praying, the church and Christ is still, like I'm saying the words, the church and Christ is still offering that prayer. So I'm actually engaging with an activity that's already happening, um, which means that prayer doesn't depend on us as much. Um, us praying, us approaching, bringing our desires to God is of course important, but the fact that the church is doing that means that the pressure is actually off us to feel like we're praying all the time, um, but to kind of join in with that rhythm, uh, which is set in Christ himself and his intercession for us on the cross. Um, and in terms of kind of posture of prayer, um, I have done some work on this, so I can let you know later down the line when I look back over my notes. Um, but the, the kind of posture at the time was one of Oran's, so praying with hands out. Um, 
which is the kind of posture of prayer often seen in the Eucharist or the Eucharistic prayer from uh, the priest offering that prayer. Um, which, if nothing else, I think really conveys that kind of that restless yearning in a physical way um, that kind of that here I am, these are my desires, move in me and offer these to God. Um, and actually prayer is being partly receiving as well as giving. Um, so Augustine's comments on the bit about the spirit praying in Romans that the spirit works in us and stirs us to prayer so actually our prayer happens because because god stirs us to prayer in the first place so actually we receive before we offer our prayers um i think the physicality of hands out um and palms open conveys that without words um yeah i hope that helps answer some of that anyone else have any questions to ask uh Father Sam, are you asking a question or are you just putting your hand over the... Nope, nope, he's not asking a question. Uh, anyone else? Going once. Going twice. Oh, knee. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. One, directly off the back of what was just said about posture and prayer um, and kind of joining with what you've been saying about groaning. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this would look in other kind of worship contexts. Um, so where do other forms of prayer, such as praying in tongues or kind of more charismatic worship practices come in here? And then the other one is completely different, maybe, but it's about kind of could you come back to, um, you talked about kind of doing theology and praying. Um, and I wondered if you could just flesh that out a little bit more, please. Great. Um, on kind of uh, Augustine's, whether he says something about kind of prayer in perhaps a more charismatic sense or in uh, senses other than what we've looked at already. Honest answer is I don't know. But I suspect he said something, um, especially one particular way of looking into that is to look at uh, passages in scripture that talk of those things and then what Augustine preaches on those to his congregation. Um, so I'd have to do some kind of rooting around for that. I've not looked particularly at the sermons in my work. Um, but I think those are definitely the place to look because there we see him not only dealing with scriptural passages that deal with these things, but also dealing with that in a context that's pastoral, that's before his congregation and uh, is encouraging them in prayer. Um, so that is a long way of saying I can follow up on that one, <laughs> um, but it's a really, really good question. Um, and then your question about theology and prayer. Um, I think there's a, there's a French scholar, uh, his surname is Sage, I can't remember what his first name is now, um, but he describes, he says that Augustine is the doctor of grace because he is the doctor of prayer. Um, and I think that kind of sums up some of what it is to have theology and prayer hang together, um, that Augustine's kind of intellectual understanding about who God is and who humanity and creation is in the, in the face of God um, comes from a relationship of prayer with God. Um, so he's not just thinking uh, through kind of philosophical systematic ideas. Uh, so when he deals with the Trinity, he's not just thinking through kind of combinations of free that work that don't fall into heresy. Um, but all the time in doing that, he's seeking to draw closer to God in relationship as well as in understanding. Um, I think it's really interesting that at the end of his theology, he often descends into prayer. So at the end of On the Trinity, he kind of gets up to a point where he's like, I just can't say anymore, I don't know what I'm talking about, and then he prays. Um, so I think theology being prayer is kind of bound up in the fact that theology starts in prayer and actually it ends in prayer. We start theology on our knees and we're brought to our knees by what we encounter of God in theology. Um, at least that's my, been my experience. So. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to ask a question? David. Thank you, Father. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, I was fascinated by the comment about, uh, I, yeah, I was strangely really moved by it, about us having to pray for the persecuted because they, for Augustine, Christ embodies their persecution. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a soteriological question. Is there, for Augustine, is there merit in being persecuted kind of prior to Christ and Christ sanctifies the persecution or is being persecuted meritorious because Christ was persecuted? In the same way that we might look at the poor, you know, I think we must, as we pray for the persecuted, we have to pray for the poor because Christ embodied the poor. Is there merit in being poor prior to Christ and he sanctifies it? Or is there merit in being poor because Christ? And depending on your answer, Karl Barth will crumble. <laughs> oh, really? Be careful. Uh, okay. <laughs> I can feel the weight to feel like theological history on my shoulders when I don't say something heretical. Um, I think the interesting thing, what that makes me think of is kind of questions of where Christ's life and Christ's crucifixion sit within time. That's kind of kind of the overarching question that this kind of uh, sanctifying of um, suffering of poverty kind of sits in. Does Christ's crucifixion have an effect backwards as well as forwards? Um, I think the interesting, the one, well, the one thing I can think of in Augustine that might help us answer this question, given that I am no expert on his soteriology, I'm afraid. I'm very much his prayer at the moment. I'm engrossed in that. Um, is that in on the Trinity, he looks at the, uh, the theophanies, so the appearances of God um, in the Old Testament. Um, so things like the uh, encounter with the three angels with Abraham that uh, is now famous in the image of the Trinity that Ruth Blev painted. Um, things like Moses and the cloud on Sinai or the cloud and the pillar of fire in the desert. Um, and Augustine is keen that God doesn't actually appear in any of those. It's the angels that are doing those kind of, uh, who are enacting those moments of encounter, but that they are summed up in the incarnation and the crucifixion of Christ. Um, and so I think there's a sense, whilst he's careful to not just read everything in the Old Testament through a kind of very simple Christ lens, um, I think that takes away too much of the complexity of it. He definitely, understands the old testament in light of the life and death of christ um, so i don't know specifically what he does say but i am inclined to say he would probably talk about christ's suffering sanctifying uh the suffering of the people of israel as well as um kind of suffering in the church um post the life of christ um, i'm afraid that's probably all i can offer just because i otherwise just don't know what i'm talking about um, but that strikes me as kind of where Augustine may well go, based on what I've read. Um, but it's a brilliant question. Very helpful. And I think Carol Burt just crumbled, so well done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Anyone else got a question? Uh, check the other screen. I can't see anybody else with their hand up and we're coming up to about half past eight. So if nobody has any other questions, then I think, I think we will draw this evening to a close. It just remains for me to say thank you once again on all of our, all of your behalf to Kirsty for this evening's um, really fascinating and um, incredibly stimulating lecture. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Um, and um, and yeah, we we hope uh, that we will see many of you next week uh, for Jarell's talk, as uh, as Father Matthew has already trailed. So uh, thank you to you all once again for joining us this evening for this Tower of Faith lecture. And a uh, recording of it all will be available on YouTube or on the on the on the website. Sorry, um, probably tomorrow. Is that right, Father Matthew? Yeah, absolutely. Once I've edited out um, a few a few little bits, like your hammock, for example. <laughs> thank you again, Kirsty. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. No, thank you for the invitation.